everyone, welcome back to QSR Nation, your go-to source for food service marketing and business strategies for success. Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of QSR Nation. As always, we have Josh, Beth, Tony, and Grant coming to you today from the PFS Brandish National Headquarters from Holtzman, Missouri to discuss food service marketing and business strategies for success. So today we have a big guest on board, uh, best one of the best favorites um, that we've ever had on board, no, no disrespect to everybody else. Uh, <laughs> we got Eric Quillman on board today. Um, Eric Quillman is a keynote speaker that has spoken in over 55 countries and has reached over 35 million people. This is a cool stat. He is number one best-selling author of five books on digital leadership and was voted the second most likable author in the world behind Harry Potter's J.K. Rowling. Ooh, pretty Ooh, cool. Nice. I would list that like as my number one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, was formerly, uh, <laughs> he was formerly a sitting professor at Harvard's MIT, at Harvard and MIT's edX labs, and he's a founder of Qualman Studios that has, that has produced film and animation projects for Disney, Chase, IBM, and many other global brands. So, uh, Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming. Awesome to be here with you and your listeners. Let's get into it. Ready to share my wounds, my failings, my mistakes, and hopefully provide some advice along the way. I love it. Awesome. Love it. So um, I know I gave a little background, but I kind of want to hear it from you. So you tell us a little bit about your background and what you do now. Yeah, the short version is that I've been in the digital space now 26 years. So actually when I was an intern back in Detroit, grew up in Detroit, born and raised in South Detroit, as Journey would say. <laughs> I started working as an intern at Cadillac, and crazy enough, they didn't have a website then. So as an intern, I just helped them program Cadillac.com, and away we went. I loved digital before people knew what digital was. And I worked at Yahoo back when kind of they're the Facebook of the day. I uh, worked for bigger companies like AT&T to help them get their online ordering capability. And there was a head of marketing at TravelZoo, which was really fortunate to have good leaders there. We took the company public. And it became the top performing stock on the NASDAQ the first year that we went public. So it's been a wild ride. I wrote a book called Social Nomics. That was my first book. And now, gosh, I've written six books. But if we look at that first book, all of a sudden, I went and gave a speech on it. And I wasn't good at public speaking. I actually have a tendency even to this day to mumble in interpersonal communication. So I didn't know this would prepare me for that moment. Like things happen for you not to you. So I thought that, oh, this is happening to me. I mumble. People make fun of me because of my voice and that I mumble. And so I took Toastmasters. And then when I became head of marketing at Travel Zoo, the founder and CEO is German. He's just German. His main language is German. <laughs> and so it's not a people person per se. That's not a skill set. And so it's forced into dealing with the press and also with the media when you take, when we're, we're a public company. And it just trained me for the moment. So sort of the publisher said, hey, we need to go speak at this event. And I spoke at the event. And there's some of the audience that said, I don't know what you do for a living full time, but you should be speaking for a living. I go, you get paid to speak for a living? They go, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> and like, That's crazy. So then <laughs> the next, uh, I had no idea that was going to take to them. But the last 11 years, I write books and I speak on stage. We own an animation studio. And we've been really fortunate to reach now 55 million people in 50 countries. So it's been a wild ride. And obviously with the pandemic, there's no live events. So we don't know where the road's going to take us. So we just keep on trucking. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm probably about 1 million views on all your social nomic <laughs> videos. So um, sorry about that. But, uh, you know, you, you obviously mentioned that you're the creator of social nomics. But how has social media and your digital storytelling it's become just an integral part in educating people about the power of social media. So tell us why you created this and what you were hoping to accomplish with all of this. Yeah, the video social nomics. So the first one is now going on a decade strong. So thanks for uh, cranking those views up to a million. That's hilarious. <laughs> I originally made that because I would sit down with anybody, let's say as a CEO or and go, look, the social media, this is not just teenager stuff. This is going to change and revolutionize the world. They'd kind of nod and go, yeah, I agree with you. Then it wouldn't do anything. So I go, man, I really need to hit these people over the head. So I go, maybe if I give them a two-minute video with statistics, rather than hearing my opinion, just like, here's the stats. It'll knock them over the head. So I made that, and I made it for the book as well, just like, here's the concept of social nomics, word of mouth on digital stories. 
And so I made the video of social comics, and then it went massively viral because there were so many people that, that needed that. Like, they, they were of the opinion that I was that social media is going to change the world. And so that went massively viral. And then I'm not the smartest guy, so it took about three calls because all of a sudden companies started calling me and going, hey, can you make a video like that social economics video for our company? And I go, no, 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 I just made that you know, for myself. My book. And then by the third call, it was like like the light bulb goes out and go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, how so that's how the studio was formed. And crazy enough, we've done some work with Disney. And so, again, that side's been a wild ride. So don't do what I did. Like when that opportunity knocked the first time, open the door. You might not get that third knock. I was just lucky that, that the third knock came. Yeah. Always, I'm writing notes always right be now. selling. Always yeah. be selling. That's right. Okay. <laughs> and well, I can safely say that like that video, I use it in every single presentation that I try and do whenever I'm talking to leadership teams or just any of our personal retailers that we work with about the power of social media because like you said, with those facts and those statistics, it is honestly the most mind blowing thing that there is. And it's when you put in a two minute video, you cannot explain it like well enough in a short time to where you can keep people's attention. But that two minute video is probably the most impactful thing that I've seen when it does come to social media. Well, and I would no, thank you. It says I heard that fat boy swim singing right here, right now. So that always helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I agree. I mean, the, the stats that you have on there, I mean, they, they are very compelling. Uh, Grant and I actually, uh, part of our presentation monthly to prospects and, you know, current franchisees that, that we bring in, uh, being an open book management company, we want to share our culture and how we do business to help them uh, do business better as well. And we play, you know, uh, whatever the current social knowledge video is for them so they can understand that it's, it's not just something we're talking about. I mean, we're doing it. We're implementing those things here. We're looking at those as part of our base strategy because it has changed the world. And, you know, we're always itching to find when the next one's coming out. So I got to ask, when's the next one coming out? <laughs> All right, I love it. We just had a call on this this morning. So it's the 10 year anniversary. So what we're trying to do is just show what's changed in the last 10 years. And so it should be coming out in the next five weeks, just before, I guess, the new year, a little before the new year. But yeah, that's when the next one's coming out. Nice. That is great. Exciting, Exciting about yeah. it. So when, when you're doing the research to put these together, I mean, how much time and, and like when, where are you able to go to, to, to aggregate all this crazy information that's in there? Because, I mean, some of the stuff is amazing that you have in these videos. Yeah, I know it's a lot of digging. It's a lot of time. And you also have to vet the source because people are very passionate to say, where'd you get that source? Where did it come from? So we have to triple vet everything that we post in there. And it's, it's kind of funny. It's harder than I would think. Like, for me, I tell my team, which isn't very helpful, I go, can you help get some stats? They have to be wow. What does that mean? It means when you look at it, you go, wow. When you say that more people own a digital device than a toothbrush, I kind of pause and go, wow, that's crazy. Right. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of the fault. And sometimes when you tell somebody to go get wow, they'll come back with a stat that's not wow. It has no context. And so that's the other thing. You need to make sure you have context. So one of the top things people remember about the first video and the subsequent videos is I go, just to give you context of big numbers, like Facebook would be the largest country in the world right now. Right. And right. so when we did that 10 years ago, people were putting stats into context. And so for me, I have to visualize that. And I go, I don't know what a billion means. And so by putting that in context and compare it to someone, that, that helps the mouse. you got to have comparative statistics. Right. That's Yeah, that's, that comparison is what makes a stat really drive home the, the fact and, 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 and the listeners or whatever. Um, but I think it's interesting. So um, you had mentioned – uh, I like how you mentioned that you got into the analytical curve like 10 years ago, way before analytics was a big thing. And now today it's everywhere from pro sports to everyday businesses that people are looking at analytics. Yeah. Um, but with all the stats that you've uh, acquired or accumulated for these videos and stuff, what was the craziest statistic or maybe your most favorite statistic that you found in your research? Oh, man, there's a bunch. It's like asking for your favorite child. But I know that <laughs> that pops to my mind are that our attention spans are less than goldfish. That's changed over time. Like, it wasn't always that case. But because of the hyperconnectivity, that our attention spans are less than a goldfish, which led me to the new book that just came out, The Focus Project. But that one definitely jumps out. The one I mentioned about more people having uh, a digital device and a toothbrush, yeah. uh, that to me is insane. 
uh, that more people join LinkedIn than the entire Ivy League every day. So that's crazy. Yeah. The more people join LinkedIn than entire classes of the Ivy League are in school right now. So they're just mind boggling these numbers. So that's why I always like to get context for my my brain. It helps me to understand it better. So obviously at the beginning, you had mentioned about how 2020 has been a crazy year for every single one of us. So how do you think the dynamic of social media has changed because of our current world climate? I mean, usage is through the roof. Yeah. So um, when you go 100% virtual, when you go from Flintstones Jetson to 100% Jetson, <laughs> I always use the analogy, you know, I always use the analogy on when I'm on stage, it's like, okay, guys, I've been talking to you now for about 10 years that this transformation's coming. Get ready. You're in your car, this wall of transformation, this digital transformation is coming. Then all of a sudden a pandemic hits, can't see it. Boom, that moves us forward three to five years. So that wall now, we smash right in that wall. That's people in our organization. And so that's been a massive shift. Just our dependency overnight has switched to virtual. Whether that's social media, whether that, look at Amazon stock. I mean, all of a sudden, you're solely dependent on Amazon to deliver items. And so all of a sudden, companies like that that were ahead of the curve that knew this was coming, uh, this transformation, all of a sudden, it hyper-accelerated three to five years forward. So there's a lot of innovation that's going to come out of this. Most of the companies that are going to rattle off that are some of the top companies in the world actually come out of times that are challenging, not out of times that are booming. Um, and so that somewhat makes sense because they see a need that needs to be met. And all of a sudden, people realize, wait, um, I actually don't like going to my supermarket. I'd rather have it just come home and it's sitting there. Yeah. Um, that's what we're trying to figure out right now. And that's what's changed dramatically. Usage and just our behavior. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Um, it's definitely changing the way we do business. And as a business, what is the importance of you know being a digital storyteller and really telling what you do and how you do it? You know, it took me a long time on the storytelling front to realize that because I grew up in the Midwest and Midwest people and values you try to avoid the words like I and me. Yeah. And so to tell your story, you don't want to tell your story, you're telling other stories. But then I realized people would ask me why I wear these crazy green glasses. <laughs> it's and those rock, by the way. Me, yeah, they tell the story. And then I realized we get the feedback. What was your favorite part of the hour keynote? Oh, I love when you told your personal story about the green glasses. And then I started to realize, and I started to look at other storytellers that are at the top of the game, and they all made it personal. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, it's not you being selfish by telling your story. I realized that we're all kind of living the same movie. There were different actors and actresses. And so by telling your story, flaws and all, that that allows that person to understand it better because they're kind of in the same movie. They're just a different actor or actress within that movie. And so the short answer to that question is personal is powerful. So the more you can personalize the story, A, it's more powerful. B, it's much easier to remember because you can remember all those details because you were in it and you lived it. Yeah. I'm, I might be going on a limb here, but um, what's the story of the green glasses? Or do you have to, do you have to uh, be at one of your presentations for that? <laughs> no, no, I'll give it to you. It's quite a long one, but. So my name is Eric Quaman. So if you take the first initial last name, it's Equal Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell people to make sure you step into your story. Not only tell your story, but step into it. And I tell people that because I resisted it for 15 years. And that's not unique. A lot of us resist our own story because it's actually uncomfortable to step into your own story at first. But long term, it's the most comfortable place you can be. And so the name like Equal Man, I hated it because people are saying, oh, Equal Man can do it. He can go get the copy. Equal Man can work the weekend. He's superpower, you know? And what happened was, again, I always implore things happen for you, not to you. And so here I am thinking this thing happened to me. What a crazy name. But all of a sudden, social explodes. And it's a good thing to have a moniker like Equal Man. It stands out. Yep. It's kind of cool. And you can own it. And what happened was the book, I think it was Digital Leader, was doing quite well. I checked out the magazine and they did an interview and they said they want to take a photo. So they go, hey, you got this weird like moniker because of Equal Man. Do you mind if we take you a picture with you with some Clark Kent like Superman glasses? 
And I go, yeah, that sounds fun. And they go, well, St. Patrick's Day is coming up. Do you mind if they're green? I go, yeah, let's, let's have fun. Whatever helps your viewership. And then they come out with these super bright green glasses. And I go, whoa, those are, those are pretty bright. <laughs> and we take the picture. <laughs> I don't think much of it. And I fly to Kenya a couple weeks later. And I'm going to give a speech. And the night before, I was going to adopt a baby cheetah from a rescue shelter. <laughs> um, not to take home. Yeah. Yeah, not to take home. My wife would kill me. <laughs> but just to su- kind of support the area. Just uh, It helps you figure out what a country is all about by doing something like that. And on the ride over, the lady that I'm with that's showing me around goes, um, you know, Usain Bolt, the Olympian, was here this week and adopted from the same litter that you're going to adopt from. We filmed him. We'd love to film you so we can combine all this video and raise more money for the shelter. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. That's fine. That sounds great. Whatever it takes. You know, if it helps out, let's do it. And then she looks at me and goes, but obviously for the filming, we want you to have your green glasses on. <laughs> and I kind of looked at her and I go, oh, I don't wear those around all the time. I look like an idiot wearing green glasses. <laughs> and they, just the look at her face, I never want to see someone look like that. I just go, oh, man. She goes, yeah, everyone in China, that's what they think you, that's who you are. <laughs> and so she gave me the gift of stepping into my story. And that's why I'm now stuck wearing these crazy green glasses. <laughs> but to be honest, it's, uh, I still walk in discomfort every day because either people are being super nice to you or they're looking at you like you're crazy. And then you sometimes forget, oh, yeah, I'm wearing bright green glasses <laughs> um, right now. But it's not easy to step in your story, but it's the most comfortable place you can be. And I'd like to say overnight, I wear green glasses, all of a sudden it changes the world. Actually, we lost some business deals because at the time, the world's gotten a lot more forgiving and a lot more open, even in the last six years. Um, but before it'd be like a business would go, no, like this is like a serious conversation. You know, we need to make money off the digital. We can't, what's up with the green glasses? Or they'd actually specifically request, we want you to speak, but we don't want you to wear the green glasses. Hmm. But conversely to that, all of a sudden we start getting more bookings because people wanted something fun and they started buying the glasses for their audience. And so all of a sudden now we, have a whole business that produces custom green glasses for these audiences <laughs> with their logos. And so it's been fun. And even in these virtual events, they're shipping them to individual homes so that we can take what we call, I got to trademark this, but screening. So instead of a selfie, we're taking a screening of everyone. Else. Uh, yeah. screening. Um, but the, the reason I tell that story is because I hope everyone out there that's listening, step in your story. It's going to be super uncomfortable at first, but then long term, it's the most comfortable place uh, that you can live. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm so glad I asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the hook is uh, he's colorblind. So <laughs> never knew they were green. There you go. <laughs> hey, even if you're colorblind, I mean, these things are like super bright. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know uh, the picture of, of the new book, uh, The Focus Project, you've got you know half your face on there, and those glasses definitely definitely jump out. So, all right. Yeah, no, that's another thing. It's like crazy. You start going out, things happen for you. You go, all right, I'm on the book on focus, and then I would never want my picture on a book, even though internationally the author's picture is always on the book. It's just different culture. But I go, oh, man, that makes sense with the glasses. How crazy is this? And it's crazy. I know it sounds weird, but literally it's like six months in writing the book that I realized, oh, wait, I wear glasses focused. Uh, so you're like, what? It took you six months? Well, that's crazy. <laughs> but, and then, then all of a sudden we go, that's cool. And so – then we can take advantage. And then I go, wait, it's 2020, 2020 vision. And all this stuff <laughs> all is going to happen for you. You just can't believe it. <laughs> that is right. That is right. There you go. All right. Hopping back into the um, regular flow of questions here. Um, so what is uh, your biggest piece of advice uh, to those that are striving to be a digital storyteller or maybe look up to what you do, kind of like Beth does? What would be one piece of advice you give to those people? But not in a creepy way, remember. Way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I love it. I love it. I think it's, uh, we're all in this together. So it's all, nothing happens without people. So it's always making sure I call posting it forward. So make sure that you're posting it forward, shine the light on other people. So don't always have, uh, and I know you guys don't do this, but I sometimes fall in this trap is don't have that selfie mentality, do the unselfie. And so always ask, especially during this pandemic, how can I help? And so how can I help? So it's always a great question when you're stuck doing something. But when it comes to storytelling, the one tip that I've learned over time 
is that A, when you have something personal happen to you, a lot of times it might be something bad. Is that just kind of take on the mindset, oh wait, something bad happened, it's gonna be a great story. So you might have bad customer service, it's a great story. If I'm on stage. Or my dad always used to say when you travel, if something bad happens on travel, A, that's why you're traveling. Because something different's gonna happen. Yeah. But B, that's the story you're probably gonna tell when the car broke down or the Lady, this happened to me once, like champagne problem. This actually happened to me twice in two months that I was on the plane and woe is me if the client had booked me in business class. And so they always ask, you want <laughs> champagne, water, or orange juice? And this was crazy. On the same flight, she spilled the tray on me twice. <laughs> Again, I said, it's a cha- champagne problem. And she said, after the second time, she actually didn't even go down my aisle again. And I was just <laughs> nice. I was like, don't worry about it. But... And then, like a month later, same thing happened. So now I always make sure my laptop's completely closed whenever anyone's <laughs> walking by. But there's always champagne problems. But the reason I tell that story is that when you have something occur that you think's an interesting story, write it down before you forget it. And then in a couple of years, you might forget that if you don't write it down. And so start to write those stories down so that you have them on the ready. And over time, it's like literally you have these stories in your mind, and then when a question's asked to you, or you're in a conversation, or you're digitally out there trying to tell your story, the best story might not be the best story for that audience. I mean, you might have, this is my best story of all time, but it's not the best story for that audience. And so it's always thinking of the audience first in mind, which isn't anything new, I'm not telling you anything new. But this stuff is simple, it's not easy. That's what I say, it's simple, not easy. Meaning if you want to get in shape, pretty simple, got to eat better, got to exercise more. But that doesn't mean it's easy. And so always put the audience first in mind and then handpick that story for that particular audience. Love it. That is awesome. Well, so when we shift back to marketing content for a moment, um, we always ask our guests what we call our big three questions. And my question for you, uh, with you know your your supervision, uh, green glasses on, what do you foresee coming up uh, in the next year as far as being the the biggest marketing trend that people need to pay attention to? Biggest marketing trend will still be its inefficient market as influencers, and so influencers have become more important because everything has gone digital, and so as social media usage dramatically increases people are looking for someone they can trust. And so if you're a trusted influencer, that becomes more powerful over time. When you can't trust the news, fake news, the people that win are the people that are consistent. They're not perfect. I would say strive for progress, not perfection, and also be flawed. Some people don't love us because we're perfect. They love us because we're perfectly flawed. And so as long as it's an honest mistake, you're good. And so as an influencer, that, in my mind, is a huge trend that's going to happen. Also, search. So voice search. You can see it. I can see it with my daughters when they ask Alexa questions. It's just a more efficient way to get stuff. And then over time, that becomes – people get freaked out about, and rightfully so, privacy and about Alexa listening to you, and she is. But <laughs> it's really about understanding what's, what's the trade off, right? And so you're trading a little bit of your privacy. For some people, definitely turn it off if it's not in your in your zone. But these companies that are smart understand they don't lose long term if they lose trust. And so if she can provide value, Alexa, and it's like that's what's crazy. You think about AI. My kids, I have to remind my daughter. I go, that's not a real person. <laughs> like, <laughs> not, she'll be like, hey, I'll come in. She's got like her elbow on the counter. She's like, hey, Alexa. <laughs> and my wife's like, hey. Copy it. That's not a real person that you're talking to. Um, so those are the top ones in my mind. Influencers, still an inefficient market. Uh, I see as doing great work there to make a marketplace for influencers. So a brand can go in and go, I need this type of influencer. I need a mommy blogger to launch XYZ. Uh, and so they're becoming a platform to make it more efficient for the influencers and also the brands. Uh, but the other big trend I see is search. Uh, and then the third trend, which isn't anything new, like it's like you didn't tell me much, but I mean, I'm buying Amazon stock because I see all the smiley face boxes that are being delivered. And what's great is that a lot of the world wasn't doing this. I've been doing this since 1999, ordering on 
Amazon before there was Prime because I could just ship Christmas gifts down to Florida and they're there yeah. rather than dragging them on the plane. And so that's going to continue to skyrocket. And you can see other trends that, you know, just obviously virtual virtual working will be interesting. Obviously, it's working well now because there's nothing else to do. But there's a reason we didn't work virtually before because uh, some people just can't do it. Right, and so right. the key is when we go back to that, that'll be interesting for me to see. I think we will go more virtual. But it's also a reminder that you need the right people on the team that, that can work virtually. Some people need more hand-holding. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so our second question is, obviously you've written quite a few books, but what is a different marketing or business book that you would recommend for everyone to read? I think this is crazy. This book's from the 1930s, but Dale Carnegie, it's not How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's his other book I think is the best. is How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. So I think that's very appropriate right now because we have all these worries, and rightfully so, during this pandemic. So that's a great book for anybody to read. And the reason that it's really marketing-based, if you look at Dale Carnegie, it's very a lot of his concepts apply to marketing. And so I think that's a great book to read in terms of that's just really helpful right now in the pandemic. I read it usually every other year just to remind me to get reset. Uh, so, again, that's Dale Carnegie, Stop Worrying and Start Living. It's crazy that we're almost – almost 100 years later, and still the concepts apply today. So that's a great book. Uh, the Heath Brothers Made the Stick is an awesome one. And then Jay Papasan and Gary Keller have The One Thing. That's an outstanding book, The One Thing. So how do I focus on the one thing that makes everything else either easier or unnecessary? And in marketing, that's applicable because in marketing, you're trying to get your story tight. You're trying to get things tight. And as Mark Twain said, I didn't have time to write you a short note, so I wrote you a long one. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And so the concept of the one thing are really helpful for marketers. All right. Yeah, those are all awesome suggestions. We'll have to check some of those out. Um, okay, last of the big three. What's one piece of advice that you would give uh, to an entrepreneur wanting to start their own business? I'd say grace. Give yourself grace. Go for progress over perfection, that no one's got all the answers. And so focus on the big things, not the little things. That's why I suggest the book, The One Thing. Focus on what, if I do this well, if I do this one thing well, what makes everything else either easier or unnecessary. And that applies even beyond entrepreneurs. If you're talking to someone that's like, say, a, there's a mom or dad in the PTA, and they're going to raise money, is that their one big thing is going to be that, that, thing for the year is that it's going to be that big, big event. It's going to be a big charitable event. If they nail that, all the other 100 little events don't matter. Conversely, if they nail the other 100 little events, but they totally fail on the big charitable event, the auction, it's not going to make up for it. So it's really about understanding always going back to that core thing. No, that's great advice. Um, and as we wrap up now, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your latest book, The Focus Project? Yeah, no, I'd love to. We actually moved it forward a couple of months, which is unheard of in publishing. We <laughs> always want to launch in October time frame. Those always sell the best. But some people are reaching out saying, hey, look, I'm physically okay during the pandemic, but I really need this focus project book now. Uh, so we did, did the unheard of and kind of moved it forward and launched the book. So it's out there available on Amazon, but it's nice. called The Focus Project, The Not-So-Simple Art of Doing Less Better. And it's crazy because I wrote it before the pandemic. So even I was just reading the Audible version. So there's stuff in there that we can't even do right now. And I talk about getting on a plane or walking my kids to the bus stop. I'm like, it's crazy. This world is going to do that right now. Yeah. Uh, but the concepts that I wanted to figure out were, hey, my hair's on fire at the end of the day too much. Like it's like Groundhog Day. And every day you get done, you're like, what? I was running 100 miles an hour. Did I get anywhere? And I go, if I'm struggling with this, I can kind of set my own time. I own my company. If I'm struggling with this, I bet everyone else is. So I started talking to people, whether they're a school teacher, a stay-at-home dad, whether it was a CEO or an entrepreneur. And it turns out everyone wrestles with it. They were all kind of figuring, I got too much stuff to do. And when people ask how you do it, they say busy. And I go, well, that's not the way to live life. It's not the way for me to live a life. It's not the way for you to live a life. Because I go, how do we figure out, get rid of busy, and just focus on big. And so that's what I did is I took a year of prep 
because I kept screwing up. I couldn't focus. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> I was like, try to focus. And then after four missed, uh, after four failings, I finally did for a year. Just each month, I'd focus on something different. But most importantly, the whole concept of the book is here's what the science shows. Here's what the street science shows. Me, the guinea pig, taking this on. Here's what worked for me. Here's what didn't work. Everyone's different. So here's kind of things that can help you from the food that we eat, because we always worry about food for how we look, but we never really worry about the food for our brain and how we can focus. And most importantly, it's for that person in your life that doesn't have time to read the book, they need to read the book. Right. Yeah. So that would be me. You're just running a million miles an hour, and you've got to take a break. No, that's awesome. Um, so where can people get your book at right now, um, and, and where can they also reach out to you too if they have questions, if they hear this podcast? Yeah, no, thank you so much. If I can help in any way, hopefully the book helps you. We took a page out of J.K. Rowling's book, no pun intended, <laughs> her book, in segments for free on her podcast. And so if you go to my podcast, which is the Super You podcast, right now we're giving 10 to 20 minute segments of the Audible version away for free. And I'm reading the book, so I'm not a professional reader, so I always kind of have some mishaps. And we'll throw some stuff in there that a publisher would probably cringe at because I'm like, I add some color to the book while I'm reading. Uh, so feel, feel free to check that out. And then I'm equal man across the board. So just on social, just equal man. And then equal man at equal man.com. So I email if I can help you in any way. And obviously the book is available right now. Most bookstores are closed. So it's on Amazon. It's on Target online, Barnes and Noble. But uh, if you want it quickly, go to Amazon. Love it. Awesome. Love it. Well, really appreciate your time, Eric. Yeah, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, it's been months in planning, and I've been excited just to be able to talk to you. And um, we, on behalf of all of our podcast listeners, they really appreciate your insight, and we can't wait to get this shared. No, thank you so much. Thanks for all the support, and let's do it again. This is fun. You guys are the best. You guys are laughing, so that's always fun. I think people (laughs) really need to laugh, have fun, and help people during this pandemic. So. If we could do this again, I would certainly welcome it. Awesome. We're going to hold you down. Yeah, that. we really yeah. are. So next week, same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, just to find us on QSR Nation, um, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can also download or listen to us on YouTube. And then also download your podcast anywhere that you like to download podcasts at QSRNation.com. All right, guys. Um, Equal Man, thank you very much. And um, for all our listeners, for all of us listening, I can't talk right now. At the very end, I messed up. That's all right. For everybody here at QSR Nation, we'll talk to you next week. Be sure to join us again for the next episode of QSR Nation.